What is a container baby? Why are containers so popular? What alternatives are there? Why should I have floor time with my baby or even wear my baby? I'm Wendy McKenna, pediatric physical therapist, and this is Newbies. He's gorgeous. Um, it's a girl. Surprise! The whole family's here. So when are you having the next one? It's just poop. Ready for another? Wow, you look really tired. Ready to go back to work? Yellow poop? Seriously? Did you sterilize this? Sex? Now? You've got to be joking. You should sleep when the baby sleeps. She doesn't look anything like you. I thought you already had your baby. I did. Babies don't come with instructions, so there's newbies, helping new moms and new babies through the first year. Welcome to Newbies, broadcasting from the Birth Education Center of San Diego. Newbies is your online, on-the-go support group guiding new mothers through their baby's first year. I'm your host, Kristen Stratton. I'm also a certified birth doula, postpartum doula, and owner of in Due Season Doula Services. If you haven't already, be sure to visit our website at newmommymedia.com and subscribe to our weekly newsletter. You can also subscribe to our show through iTunes, so you'll automatically get new episodes when they're released. Sunny's here to tell us about the other ways you can participate in our new show. Okay, so we love to hear from our listeners, and there are some great segments that you guys can participate in. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, We have people already submitting for our Ask the Expert segment, so that is a segment that you can send us your questions, anything you're experiencing with your new baby, and, you know, questions that you have, and we'll have our experts answer them. And then we'll include that on a future episode, so you guys, um, everyone can basically benefit from the question that you asked. Um, We have a fun segment where we talk about our baby oops, the, the funny things that we've done with our newborns and our, our babies through that first year um, that maybe wasn't so funny when it actually happened, but in hindsight, it's really funny. <laughs> and so we like, to, <laughs> we like to share that with our listeners. So uh, those are just a couple of segments. You can go to our website and the newbie section and see all of the different segments you can submit for. If you're interested in being part of those segments, uh, you can go to the contact link on our website, send us your story that way, and we'll work it into a future episode. Or if you'd actually like to tell the story yourself or like, the, like to ask ask the question yourself, you can call our voicemail, and that number is 619-866-4775, and uh, we will include that in a future episode, and you can actually tell your own story as opposed to me or Kristen being your mouthpiece, right? Yes. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's go ahead and meet our panelists. We have two in the studio and one on the phone. Um, Let's start with Ruthie. I'm Ruthie Slatham. I'm 28 years old, and I have a five-year-old boy, a -a two-and-a-half-year-old girl, and then Piper is three months. And she's in the studio, too, so you might hear from her a little bit. (laughs) Julie? Um, I'm Julie Schmidt. I am 55. (laughs) I'm a birth doula, postpartum doula, and a mom and a wife, and I have uh, 10 kids, and they range in age from 9 to 33. And you're a grandma, too. Oh, yes. I'm a grandma. (laughs) And we have Natalie calling from Texas. Hi. uh, I'm Natalie. I'm 28 years old. Kind of a big family. (laughs) I have 11 children now. I have twin uh, fraternal four-year-old, two-year-old identical girls. Um, I have one-year-old identical boys. I have a 10-month-old baby girl. And I just delivered a set of quadruplets who will be three weeks old tomorrow. Wow. Wow. (laughs) I know, right? Wow, indeed. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. Okay, so before we start our discussion today on container babies, we are going to talk about a story. It's a nice heartfelt story because, you know, sometimes we, we need that as new moms. We need to hear really good stories. And I know one of the things as a new mom I was really dreading was getting on a plane with one baby, let alone four babies now, trying to get on a plane is kind of crazy. And I don't even want to go with Natalie. I don't know how you ever would get on a plane with 11 children. Um, <laughs> but in this particular... It's not possible. Right? Yeah. No, I don't think so. She, it's a private let alone, Let alone the con cost of handling something like that. Yeah, I need a, I need a private plane. <laughs> <laughs> right, I know. So this story, though, is really nice and heartwarming. Um, there is a mother, she actually posted this to Facebook, and I love that she did that. She um, was planning this flight to uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan, 
uh, or sorry, from Kalamazoo, Michigan, to Fort Rucker, Alabama, to surprise her husband, who is a member of the U.S. Army. And uh, she just had a newborn baby. And again, she, you know, had all this kind of anxiety about getting on the plane. What are we going to do? And as a new mom, I'm sure she was very sensitive to all the eyeballs that were watching her. She was getting on the plane. And she made her way back to the back of the plane, which, by the way, why do they, they always put us at the back of the plane? It's Next like the bathroom. the bathroom. But they do usually let you on early. So right. I guess, you know, if you got to go to the back of the plane, at least you're getting on early. So Rebecca gets on the plane with her daughter, Riley, and she's making her way towards the back. And she noticed that, you know, people are kind of giving her these eyeballs. And uh, there was another uh, person that was sitting right next to her. And she said in her words that she turned out to be a godsend. So basically, this woman um, said her, her baby started crying and she just didn't know what to do. And this uh, this woman next to her just took her baby and held her baby for this mom the entire flight, which it doesn't say how many miles that is. But, you know, if you think about, you know, Michigan to Alabama, you know, that's not, yeah, that's pretty far, right? And, you know, just to have that kind of help and support is just so amazing and, you know, I don't know. It's just such a nice little story. What, what do you guys think about this? I'm so relieved to hear a positive baby airplane story because <laughs> yes. know, right? in the last few months, it's been either, you know, problems with airlines not supporting breastfeeding or right. people getting annoyed or moms having to make little goodie bags for the people sitting next to them just so they won't get upset with them. So I'm so relieved to hear a story where someone flew and had a positive experience with their newborn. And that mom that took the baby, it says here that she is a mom of three and she just remembered. She remembered she what it, it was like, you know, to, to travel with babies. So Wendy, what do you think? Oh, I think it's amazing. Finally, a good story. Right? <laughs> yes. Right? I know. Julie, what do you think? I think it's great. I think a lot of times I've been in the situation where I've been on a plane with um, new mommies and daddies and tried to like engage with them and talk to them and try, um, you know, to say if there's anything I can do. A lot of times they're not willing to give you their baby, you know, because they don't know you. <laughs> she must so, have been desperate. She must mama. have been. She's like, I, so I, I got to hand, hand it to her for that. Uh, but yeah, that it's fun. I, I don't mind babies on a plane. My dad used to travel all the time, and I know for a fact that he's held a baby or two because babies just love my dad for whatever reason, <laughs> and he had four children of his own, so, you know, he's held a baby or two, so mom could go potty right, or, right. or whatever, held a crying baby. They just love him, so it's just really nice to hear that. I know. We it's... should stick out, stick up for each other more often. Mm-hmm. Today on Newbies, we're discussing container babies. What are they and what impact is this having on our children? Our expert, Wendy McKenna, is a pediatric physical therapist, owner of Strides Physical Therapy in Solana Beach, and co-creator of a baby wellness program called Move, Play, Grow. Thanks so much for joining us, Wendy, and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me back. Wendy, what is a container baby? Okay, so a container baby is um, fondly referred to those babies who are frequently in various types of containers. The gear that we have that you see from floor to ceiling when you walk into those big box baby stores. <laughs> or my house. Or your house. <laughs> well, when you have 11, you got to have a few of those. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, but oftentimes babies are placed in containers um, rather than doing other things that they used to do before those containers existed. So... What are some of the more common items you see parents using with their newborn and infant? So definitely the car seat is the big one. Um, People believe that car seats are one of the safest places for babies to be because in the car they are. However, you're in a car that is a moving vehicle that can crash and roll over. And so in the car, yes, they are. But if you actually get out of the car, the car seat is one of the least safe places for babies to be. The incidence of sleep apnea and the incidence of desaturation of oxygen levels is higher in a car seat than in any other place. So they really are not that safe. But because they've been marketed as such in the car, people assume that they're also safe elsewhere. And then you have these great, great, quote unquote, great travel systems where you can click things in and out and it's very convenient for people to just do that especially with a sleeping baby when you have sleep deprived moms and finally the baby falls asleep in the car and the last thing you want to think about doing is waking them to transfer them somewhere else but really that's what we should be thinking about doing instead. 
And what about all these swings? So, and... yeah, and then inside the home, you've got the swings, you've got infant seats, you've got bumbo chairs, you've got jumpers, you've got um, standers. There's just so many different types of devices that are made that prop babies in positions that they themselves cannot get to. Um, the reasons why some of these are so popular is um, number one, marketing. Um, you know, they, they are marketed as good for baby's development when in actuality it's more about parental convenience. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with parental convenience from time to time. We need to take care of ourselves first. And if we aren't taking care of ourselves, then we definitely cannot be taking care of our babies. So if you need a break, yes, by all means. But if you think that you're doing something good for your baby's social, emotional, physical, sensory development, it's just incorrect. You're not. And um, and so we just really need to be more thoughtful about how we use them and what we're using them for. So those are all the containers. And, and oftentimes I go to people's homes and I'll see that, you know, oh, look, we, have, we sit them here and then we put them in the swing and then we put them in the standard. So they're getting all this exercise when really that's not exercise um, at all. And so we, we talk about all the alternatives that you can do other than having them in containers. And how does our current style of parenting differ from other generations, for better or for worse? So <laughs> throughout the ages, we have had many cultures throughout the world and throughout time that have changed the way that we um, parent our babies, the way that we handle our newborns, anywhere from, you know, separating them completely from the family and taking them out to the farm to, you know, attachment parenting. We've gotten all through. And, and people from generations ago would look at the way that we parent now and think we're crazy, just like we think they're crazy. So I think the important thing is to understand the importance of maternal instinct and to really dig deep into yourself and feel what's right for you because what is right in our culture currently sometimes is good and sometimes is bad and sometimes it just blocks us from really believing in ourselves and having confidence in ourselves and what we can really do for our babies. Um, so right now, um, our current style of parenting is is there, there's definitely a wave of those who are keeping their babies close and, and tight to them more often. But then there's also this culture that we have where we have to get things done. Everyone is on the go and, you know, you just need to be pulled here in this direction and in that direction. And so babies sometimes get forgotten in that in that mad rush. And so we aren't as present with our babies. And technology is one of the hardest things to put down. If, if, anyone, if everyone could just put down their cell phones and just pay attention to their baby and just be with their baby, I think that they would allow themselves to kind of think, of, think for themselves what they're doing. Um, and then you have the big box baby stores and the baby showers and, you know, all the, the gear and the stuff that everyone says that you think th that you need. And you're like, why do I need all this stuff? You know, my mom didn't have all this stuff, but it's available now. So, you know, there's a lot going against us in terms of really following our own instincts. And panelists, how many of these products have you used and why did you feel like they were helpful or necessary? We'll start with Julie. Well, I started parenting 33 years ago and some of those things were available a swing but they were crank swings so we had yes. you know we had we had mad skills then because we pushed the swing back and crank it so it didn't make any noise and then let the swing go so the baby would continue sleeping um but that you know that we did use those um but mostly my kids were on the ground um on blankets you know or being the, and carrying them or front packs were not as prevalent either um not until my last child and then she i wore her everywhere she went everywhere on the front of me um so they but even still she also was on the ground to the point where they would get into things that i didn't know they could that they would start to crawl when i didn't think they were going to so you know for instance one of my kids cr i had a we didn't have air conditioning we had a fan on i had an oscillating fan and he crawled to the fan and was almost getting his fingers in there when i happened to come back in the room and he was four months old so i can see why people would lean towards putting babies in containers, knowing that there's things like that that happen, you know. Um, but that wasn't what, you know, that wasn't my way just because they really weren't, there wasn't a whole lot available. Um, but I'm also a foster parent and have been fostering for 20 years. So keep, you know, abreast of all the new things that are going on and have used some containers. Um, but especially the bouncy seats, mm -hmm. you know, those kinds of things to put them in there on the ground, buckled up so I can maybe start dinner. What's your experience with containers? So my experience with my first, um, which was five years ago, was like 
you need one of everything. You need all these things. And we had a very small space. So um, I had mostly like a swing. I had a bouncer. Um, I had a bassinet. Um, but uh, and then my, my folks had a, a jumper at their house. So with him, um, I did use it quite a bit because you know first time mom it's like you you're need everything you need everything and, and you're just getting used to being a mom and it's like this sense of self has to be put on hold so it's uh you know you you're like well I need time for me and so I'm going to use this this thing so that I can just not be touched for a while yeah um and then with my second one I was so busy chasing my first that I actually didn't use the containers that much um I I discovered uh baby wearing and um, became completely smitten with that and that was way more useful to be able to chase after my first than to take it's like if you take the baby to the mall in the travel system and your two-year-old bolts do you go after the two-year-old or do you leave the infant by yourself so the wrap became a lot more um convenient for me uh and then uh, yeah, and it's kind of funny because my first one, he didn't walk until a year, and my second walked at seven months. So <laughs> Yeah, because that's something that I hear from a lot of people who maybe aren't as familiar with baby wearing. They say, oh, well, you know, you don't want, you must not want your kid to walk on time. No, and, she's running, so that's yeah. why she's on my back. I don't yeah. want to chase her from the <laughs> store. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I did the same thing. I had I had the bumbo. I had the pack and play. I had the swing. I had the extra saucer. I had the bouncer. I had the crib. I had I had everything. That was a ridiculous amount of money that I wasted. Yeah, We're I down had, to a swing with yeah. this one. <laughs> so. And then with my second and third, I pretty much baby wear, you know, would baby wear all the time, and that was about it. I still baby wear, even though I have a toddler, so. Wendy, what kind of physical issues are you seeing in these container babies? So the one that's most egregious at this point is plagiocephaly. And so plagiocephaly is that dreaded flat spot um, on the back of infant's head. If it's directly in the back, it's actually called brachycephaly. If it's to the side, so it's more of a parallelogram shape, that's plagiocephaly. Um, In the 1970s, one in 300 babies had uh, a plagiocephaly. Since the Back to Sleep program, which also coincides with the increase of our container culture, and I think the container culture is more of a problem than the Back to Sleep in terms of this, some research studies are showing as high as one in two, most of them one in six. So it, it, it's gone from one in 300 to one in six, basically. And so these are the helmet, the babies that are walking around that, that a lot of them have helmets on now to help reshape the head. So that is what you'll see the most um, in terms of some of the more subtle things that many um many people don't pick up on are the asymmetries in development because um, if there is a slight flat flat spot on the back of the head you are also going to have asymmetry of muscle development which then um, in the head and neck doesn't allow for full range of motion or equal balance side to side and so you'll have just little subtle differences in the way that they look the direction they look how they look and and um, and then that falls down into the um, spine the upper extremities the hips and the lower extremities Remedies. So it, it, it really affects the whole the whole body. Um, so oftentimes I do get um, referrals for physical therapy for babies who are um, either experiencing a plagiocephaly and or torticollis, which is the um, shortening of the neck muscle, the sternocleidomastoid, and all the others that are around it. Um, that contributes to asymmetries in development and developmental delays. What kind of developmental delays are you seeing? So the developmental delays that I'm seeing for the most part are that babies just really aren't moving as well on the floor anymore. Um, they don't develop the front and the back muscles um, equally. And so when they start to try and move side to side and then rotation, because that's the order that it goes in, because the balance is off, everything is thrown off a little bit. And again, this doesn't mean that baby isn't going to crawl. It doesn't mean they're not going to walk or stand up. It just means that their balance is not there as as well as it could be. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times some of these things don't show up until a little bit later on in, in life as well. So... Why do you think there is not more of a movement to change this culture of container babies? I don't think a lot of people know about it. I don't think a lot of people know what a container baby is. I think that they don't understand the importance of why babies should be out of containers. So just very briefly, a container is 
is a is a plastic thing that that holds your baby in one spot and it doesn't respond to your baby's movement versus something like holding your baby or wearing your baby they are feeling human movement they are close to you if you if they need help with their posture you are right there to help them back with it um, but you know you put a baby in a container in a position that they themselves cannot get to the reason they're not there yet on their own is because they don't have the postural control to get there yet. And to, in order to develop that postural control, they don't practice that skill. They have to be on the floor and developing it. So it's not like us where if we want to go you know, play golf, we go practice golf and do golf drills. You know, It's not the same thing. If we want our baby to learn how to sit, we don't sit them. We put them on the floor and let them develop their front muscles, their back muscles, and how to balance them for moving side to side and rotating. And that is all blocked in containers. And alignment is off because 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 they don't have the posture control. When you put your baby in something, especially when it's on an incline, you put them in and they look all pretty and beautiful. And then within 30 seconds, they've slumped down and their head is off to the side and their pelvis is over the other side. And they're just kind of stuck there. And um, a lot of babies will tolerate this because their internal drive to be upright is so strong and thank goodness that internal drive to be upright is so strong because they have to work their rear ends off in that first year of life to get up into standing and walking they go from being completely helpless and having no voluntary control when they're born to independent walkers in 12 months it's just an amazing um, transition that they make in those in those months and by putting them in containers we are essentially blocking them from doing that very development so when we come back, we will continue our discussion about container babies and talk about the importance of floor time. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. We're talking with Wendy McKenna about container babies and the risks of infant restraint devices. Wendy, can you explain the importance of floor time and why this has become so necessary? Okay, so going back again to our culture and the way that many cultures throughout the world raise their infants um, and have over time. Um, there are a lot of cultures who don't let their babies touch the floor um, for years. And, you know, and then when they're four years old, all of a sudden they're off and running. And, and so people try to talk to me about, well, it's really not that important. But you have to understand that in that culture, um, you know, they're in a developing, a developing country. And once their child's on the ground, they're off and running and they're not stopping. Our culture is different. We are in the, we are in the technology age where the draw to our devices is so strong and we have an epidemic where we are becoming more and more and more sedentary. And so it is important to start from day one allowing our babies to move because if you don't get that coordination and that desire and the foundation strong when it's when babies are at their maximum capacity to to learn it, then by the time they're five years old, they're not going to have the skills that are going to help them to carry them forward. And so being on the floor versus being in a container allows baby myriad opportunities to make mistakes, to explore, to learn. Hi, darling. I just got a good smile. <laughs> to, you know, to learn and to explore. I know I'm talking to you. <laughs> and, and really, there's nothing holding them back. Um, again, floor time, I like to, to differentiate between floor time and tummy time because tummy time is really important, especially since the back to sleep program. Before back to sleep, babies had cumulative 20 hours a day on their stomachs. Since back to sleep, we are now lucky to get 30 minutes. So you can imagine all of that development that is missing from just the sensory experience of having deep pressure on the front side of your body and being able to kick and, and reach and drag your arms and legs and feet um, across the ground and get that rich sensory input from the floor against that side of your body. It's not there when you're on your back. So when you're, tum when you're on your tummy and on the floor, it's a great experience. But we all have 360 degrees around our body. So floor time is back time. It's side lying. It's tummy time and every degree in between. So you do not need to always be on your tummy. And, and I, I do a lot of tummy time talks in classes and, and because I know it's a, it's a big deal and there are a lot of babies that don't like it. But being on the floor, even if they're on their back, is better than being in a container on their back. Sometimes containers might be necessary to keep babies safe in a busy household. What alternatives do parents have to some of the containers you have mentioned? So um, 
the pack and plays definitely can help um, contain baby and keep them safer from you know crawling over to the fan or being trampled by a sibling um, <laughs> or, or, dog. or or licked by a dog <laughs> exactly so that that's definitely one thing you can do um, and and the panelists have already talked about baby wearing I think baby wearing is a wonderful alternative um, you can't always have baby on the ground because you're moving around and you want to be close to your baby and it's the best way because even though baby's not necessarily initiating their own movement and exploring they are attached to you they are feeling human movement they are responding to human movement they have the capacity to look at you in the eye and communicate with you and you have the capacity to immediately respond and so if you can't have them on the floor and and with my babies what I did is I had a floor time mat that was um, a, the right enough consistency that I would have it next to me all the time so it was my bath mat when I took a shower it was next to me doing laundry it was next to me when I was you know kit or in the kitchen away from the stove oh. um, <laughs> Yes, please. Safety. Safety first. Safety, safety first. Safety, safety first. <laughs> if you have a great floor time mat that is, um, you know, good on a tile surface, on a floor surface, then you don't always have to worry about keeping them in a carpeted area. Um, and then, again, looking back at our containers, there are straps in our containers that keep our babies strapped in, but they do nothing to align them appropriately. And especially with a newborn baby who has no postural control, when you put them in something that in an, in an incline, their top half slinks down on the bottom half and it puts extra pressure on the diaphragm for breathing. And if their head rolls over to the side, it cuts off their airway a little bit. So it's no wonder that we have increased sleep apnea and increased desaturation of oxygen levels in these containers versus on the floor. Um, and so, but with baby wearing, you can have them close to you. You can check on them. And so, you know, a container is not necessarily a safe place for them to be either because if they get out of alignment, you know, you're, you're kind of risking some of that breathing difficulty. So. Yeah, and I liked baby wearing just for also breastfeeding because Absolutely. then you can pick up on those mm -hmm. early hunger yep. cues and you're not always feeding your baby because they're screaming their head off. Right. <laughs> you're, you're picking up on that lick lipping and that little, you know, turning of the head. Absolutely. So um, I'm assuming that means you recommend baby wearing I to everyone. Love, <laughs> you know what? Babies, babies really should not you shouldn't even really consider a baby stroller until they're at least six months of age because they need to be sitting up independently and having that postural control to be in a stroller. So definitely until six months baby wearing. And I um, just took my two and a half year old to Disney World uh, two months ago. And we, you know, there's lots of kids who are three, four and five years old in strollers at Disney World and mine walked. I definitely advocate for, you know, taking walks with your baby when they're walking independently and just going slower on your walks. <laughs> so. I love that you are just such a proponent of moms listening to their instinct because we, we suppress that so much and it really is so important. I mean, nine times out of 10 moms instincts are probably right. So I really thank you for really encouraging of that. Of course. Thank you so much, Wendy, and our lovely panelists for chatting with us today about container babies and the, risks and the risks of infant restraint devices. And for our Newbies Club members, our conversation will continue after the end of the show as Wendy will share some of her creative ideas for making floor time fun for the whole family. For more information about the Newbies Club, please visit our website at newmommymedia.com. It's time for a fun segment here on Newbies, and it's called Baby Oops, and it's where you guys share your funny stories of fun things, interesting things, embarrassing things maybe, that have happened during this first year with your baby. And so this one comes from Rebecca. Rebecca writes, well, when we got home, we were going to lay our little girl out on our bed, and my husband put her on a pillow in the middle of the bed, and she instantly rolled over and landed on her face, just for a second, of course. Then, while nursing her, like three minutes later, she was falling asleep. And the nurses had told us to sprinkle a little water on her head to wake her up. I totally remember nurses telling me that, too. All I had was a water bottle. <laughs> so I tried pouring a little, but I had unsteady hands, and I poured it all over her. Well, it woke her up for sure. We were pretty sure at that point someone was just going to come and pick her up. <laughs> It's so true, though. As first-time parents, you're like, okay, who's going to call CPS? Who's going to be the first person that calls and takes my baby away from me? So funny. Thanks so much for submitting.
editing this. If you guys have a funny baby story you want to share with our audience, you can reach out to us a couple different ways. You can go to our website at newmommymedia.com. Click on the contact link. Send us a message that way. Or we'd love for you guys to tell your own stories. Use your own voice and tell your own story. And the best way to do that is to call our voicemail. That number is 619-866-4775. Leave a message and we'll include it in an upcoming episode. That wraps up our show for today. We appreciate you listening to Newbies. Don't forget to check out our sister shows, Preggy Pals for Expecting Parents, Parent Savers for Moms and Dads with Infants and Toddlers, The Boob Group for Moms Who Breastfeed, and Twin Talks for Parents of Multiples. Thanks for listening to Newbies, your go-to source for new moms and new babies. This has been a New Mommy Media production. The information and material contained in this episode are presented for educational purposes only. Statements and opinions expressed in this episode are not necessarily those of New Mommy Media and should not be considered facts. While such information and materials are believed to be accurate, it is not intended to replace or substitute for professional medical advice or care and should not be used for diagnosing or treating health care problem or disease or prescribing any medication. If you have questions or concerns regarding your physical or mental health or the health of your baby, please seek assistance from a qualified health care provider. New Mommy Media is expanding our lineup of shows for new and expecting parents. If you have an idea for a new series, or if you're a business or organization interested in joining our network of shows through a co-branded podcast, visit newmommymedia.com.